hopes that tomorrow or Sunday, because I love being together with you, dear friends who I love. Well, if you have your Bible, go ahead and turn with me to the book of Acts, chapter 17. If you don't have your Bible this morning, there should be a stack of paperback Bibles uh, on the table at the back. Uh, there, you're welcome to grab one of those, use those. If you don't own a Bible, we'd love that to make that our gift to you. So we're in Acts, chapter 17. Please join me in prayer. Well, Father in heaven, I thank you for the gift of your church. I thank you, Father, for the gift of your word, for the gift of your self-revelation contained in these pages. I thank you, Father, for the gift of your spirit, that you have sent your spirit to dwell within us, and you promise to illumine your word. And so, Father, I pray that you would do that now. Open up your word to us. Open up our eyes to see and our hearts to receive what you want to say to us this morning. Father, I pray that you would grant us a passion for your glory. Grant us a love for others, Father. As John prayed earlier, a love for those in the church, but also, Father, a love and a compassion, Father, for those all around us in this world. We need you, Father. We love you and pray now that you would help us by your spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, read with me in Acts chapter 17, beginning in verse 16, reading through the end of the chapter. Now, while Paul was waiting for them at Athens, his spirit was provoked within him as he saw that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the devout persons and in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be there. Some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers also conversed with him, and some said, what does this babbler wish to say? Others said, he seems to be a preacher of foreign divinities because he was preaching about Jesus and the resurrection. And they took hold of him and brought him to the Areopagus, saying, may we know this new teaching that you are presenting, for you bring some strange things to our ears. We wish to know, therefore, what these things mean. Now all the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there would spend their time in nothing except telling or hearing something new. So Paul, standing in the midst of the Areopagus, said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. For as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, I found also an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God. What therefore you worship is unknown, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place, that they should seek God in the hope that they might feel their way toward him and find him. Yet he is actually not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as even some of your own poets have said, for we are indeed his offspring. Being then God's offspring, we ought not to think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of man. The times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. Because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. Now when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked. But others said, we will hear you again about this. So Paul went out from their midst. But some men joined them and believed. Among whom also were Dionysius the Areopagite and a woman named Damaris, and others with them. May God bless the preaching of his word. Well, even though he lost last weekend, it is difficult to dispute the fact, difficult to argue against the proposition put forth that Tom Brady is the greatest quarterback that's ever played the game. I say that with pain in my voice as a diehard Dallas Cowboys fan born and raised in Dallas. And yet to watch the man play is, is a wonder. I want to congratulate my friends that are in this room who are Eagles fans. It was a wonderful game. I'm very happy for you. But the joy is fleeting, my friends. 
In fact, Tom Brady, a quarterback who has won five Super Bowls and has lost three, he's played in eight Super Bowls, played in more Super Bowls than any other quarterback who's ever played the game, winning five of them, was once asked, after winning multiple Super Bowls, what he felt at that point. And he said, in a very honest, a very transparent moment, he looked and said, I, I just, I thought that there'd be something more. And I think that that echoes a feeling that, that many of us have going through life, is that there's something more, that there's something more to life than just this, that we, we want to live for something bigger than ourselves. We feel a lack of meaning or purpose. And in fact, we are created for more than a mundane existence. We are created for more. In fact, as we seek, as, as, uh, as Juan said earlier, there are many lords in life. There are many Another word for that is idols. There are many places to which people seek purpose and meaning and fulfillment in the world, but only Christianity has the answer, the solution, the one thing that never lets down, the living water, the source of living water that always satisfies. Christianity gives us, as we sing songs about, new life. It gives us forgiveness. The gospel of Jesus Christ, by faith in Jesus Christ, we receive forgiveness of our sins, reconciliation with God. We receive a new identity and also a new purpose. We're called, as uh, Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, we're called ambassadors of Christ, God making his appeal through us to the world. We're given a new identity and with that, a new commission. But often we forfeit this mission because we get distracted. We lack motivation. I read the book of Acts, and I, I wish that I was there at times thinking, I wish that I could be like Paul, with Paul, doing these things. Not necessarily the parts where he's getting beaten and you know, flogged. But I want to be there seeing all this exciting things happen. But the promise of God is that he gives his spirit so that we can continue this work. The book of Acts is the beginning of the disciples of Jesus Christ, the ordinary Christians that Jesus commissioned to carry his great commission into the world. And that continues today. But until, until we see like, G, like Paul saw, until we feel like Paul felt in this chapter, we will not, we will not proclaim as he did. The central truth that I, that I want to communicate this morning from this passage is that uh, with Paul, we want to have passion for God and compassion for people, and then we will be provoked to personal evangelism. So we want to see that under three headings. We want to see what Paul saw, we want to look at what Paul felt, and then we'll see what Paul did. So the first one, what Paul saw. Paul is here in Athens. He's waiting for Silas and Timothy in Athens. This is, it's important to note that this wasn't the intended, it wasn't his destination where they were going. It says that they were on their way to the sea and that Paul was waiting for them in Athens. But while he was waiting, he wasn't simply sitting there idle, but he, was, he wasn't just resting and taking in the sights, but rather he looked around and considered this great city of Athens. Athens is a very familiar city to most of us. Many of us know that this was once the cultural center of the, of the ancient world. This is the home of Socrates and Plato, Aristotle, of so many great thinkers in the fields of medicine and mathematics, of politics and astronomy, philosophy. But at this point, when Paul was here, at this point, the golden age was over. Rome had conquered this city, and it had become a very different kind of city, totally given over to idolatry. And so Paul is in Athens. He's looking around. He's viewing the temples. He's looking at these altars and the images of the city through the eyes. Through the eyes, remember who Paul is. Paul is a man who is brought up in Jewish monotheism. There's one God. He's very familiar with the second commandment. Remember this? You shall not worship any carved idol, any carved image. And now he's looking around, and he sees idols everywhere. Not only um, were they in the city, but they were all over the place. Athens was one of the oldest cities that Paul had visited, and therefore the, the number and the diversity of idols that he would have seen would have been astronomical. In, in Ephesus, which was a smaller city and not as old as uh, as Athens, there were 29 gold statues of Artemis. There were 120 statues of Nike and Eros. The temples and the public spaces of Athens would certainly have had a lot more than Ephesus. And so he looks around and he sees them everywhere. Later on, Paul references this in the book of Romans, chapter 1, and he says, 
Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images, images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and reptiles. And again, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, he says, what pagan sacrifice they offer to demons and not to God. He says, I do not want you to become participants with demons. So Paul looks around and he sees idols everywhere, rampant idolatry. Pagan worship abounding. The God of his faith, the God that he loved and worshipped, was being mocked, was being rebelled right in front of him everywhere he turned. And we see the same thing today. Later this year, we're going to send a team to Nepal, joining with another church, uh, one of our sister churches, maybe other churches, and, and hopefully many of you will be going on this trip. I am planning to go to this trip. And one of the things, this, this is a trip that uh, a number of our people have gone on the last few years, and as I've heard from them, what was the trip like? Uh, one of the things that they all remark on is the fact that, that these idols, which is kind of difficult, sometimes we don't necessarily see that in our day-to-day existence here in Texas, but in Nepal, the primary religion is Hinduism. And in Hinduism, there are 33, something like 33 million gods that they worship. And they have carved statues, carved idols everywhere. And this was, this was a surprise to some of the people who went. They, they thought, I didn't realize that this still went on today. But idols aren't simply statues. They aren't simply, they are that, but they aren't simply that. Idols are anything that we worship in the place of God. Your heart was created to worship. Our hearts are created for something greater. When we think of idol worship, we don't have to think primarily of Hinduism or other religions, but simply what goes on in our own hearts. It's whatever controls us. Whatever is most important to you, that's what you worship. Whatever is most important to you. So the person, the person who seeks power is controlled by power. They worship power. The person who seeks after money is controlled by money. The person who is controlled by the people that he or she wants to please, they're controlled by people. People pleasers. That's what, that's what we call them. We don't control ourselves, but rather we're controlled by whatever is most important in our lives. Tim Keller defined an idol this way. He said, if it is anything more important to you than God, anything that absorbs your heart and your imagination more than God, anything that you seek to give what only God can give, An idol is whatever you look at and say in your heart of hearts, if I have that, then my life will have meaning. Then I'll know that I have value. Then I'll feel significant and secure. The true God of your heart, one easy way to discern what the idols in our hearts are is whatever our minds turn to when we're bored, whenever we are daydreaming and our minds naturally gravitate somewhere. Maybe it's advancing your career or or stuff. Maybe it's a, a nicer house or a house, period. Maybe it's a relationship. You, wherever, you're, wherever our minds go to naturally and think that's what's going to bring me happiness, that's what's going to bring me joy, that's what's going to create satisfaction in my life, that, that is an idol, friends. What do you habitually think about to get joy and comfort in the privacy of your heart? Whatever brings you joy, really, whatever's most important to you, wherever you put your ultimate worth, wherever you consider yourself, if that, then I'll have value. And most of the time, our idols can be good things. We can, we can pursue relationships or a career, and those are not bad things. They're not intrinsically evil. They're good things, but they're good things often that we want too much. We place too much value on that. We look to our spouses and want them to deliver more for us than what they were intended to be. Only God can fulfill. Only God can carry that weight. But the world around us worships any number of things that are not God. While some of them are actual images, most of them are unseen idols. But if we want to grow in our, in our faithfulness in personal evangelism, We need to look around with discerning eyes and see like Paul saw. We need to look around and see the idolatry all around us for what it is. We need to see as Paul saw. We also also need to feel as Paul felt. And that's our second point, what Paul felt. So still in this first verse, have made a lot of progress. We'll pick up the pace. Still in the first verse, it says that Paul was provoked. He was grieved. He was distressed. He was agitated because of what he saw. This word provoked, 
uh, it comes from the Greek word per, paroxysmos, and which is where we get the English word that I've never used in my life, paroxysm. I looked this up. <laughs> paroxysm has this idea of, of a seizure, of, of some kind of sudden something that's intense. And so he has this paroxysm. He, he has a sudden feeling of being provoked. He was grieved. He was distressed. He was agitated because of the idol worship that he saw. This is a word that is used, if you do a, a study of this word throughout the Bible, it is a word that's used frequently in the Bible, and usually it refer, references God's divine jealousy for his people with regard to idol worship. So God is a jealous God. He is jealous for us to worship him alone and no other gods, no idols, he says. But when we think of jealous, we don't want to think of the negative connotations of jealous. We don't think of, well, well, that's a sinful feeling. Why would we worship God who is jealous? Is he insecure? Is that what it is? No, jealousy is not that. It's a, it's a good thing when it comes to God. It, there's absolutely a sinful side of jealousy, but with God, it is absolutely righteous and good. It's a compassion. It's a compassionate indignation that he has. It's like when you look at someone, you look at someone who you love, and you see them make a decision that is going to wreak havoc in their lives, and you just something wells up inside of you, and you just want to say, no, don't do that. That is this kind of jealousy. It's that kind of jealousy that says, that's not going to satisfy. That's not going to bring you happiness. That's only going to lead to destruction and misery in your life. That's the kind of feeling that he had here. So he was provoked. Maybe a silly illustration of being provoked is I was at a meeting this last week, and someone referenced the queen while we were in this room. And somebody else said, what queen? Well, we had someone in the room who was formerly a citizen of, uh, of the British country, which has a queen, the queen, and she was startled. She was provoked. She said, what queen? What, what are you talking about, what queen? The queen. That's what queen. She was provoked. On a more serious note, I was in Houston a number of months ago following the, the hurricane uh, that, that wreaked havoc in the city. And I was with a team of, of members of this church who were there serving families, who were there cleaning out homes, gutting their homes. These people who had disaster come into their lives, whose homes were gone, their, their possessions of 30 years were just literally washed away. And we were in home after home, and there was this one home that I remember walking up to, and there was this man there that, uh, very sad situation. He didn't have any family, didn't have, he didn't have any friends to speak of. And we were just going door to door, knocking on the doors, representing it. We were there with our uh, sister church there in the area that was affected by this. And we're knocking on doors saying, can we help you? Can we, can we do anything? Are you, do you need any help of any kind? And so we're there primarily like pulling out wet sheetrock and pulling up carpet, getting all the, the wet stuff out so that the mold that was already growing rapidly in there could, could get away, you know, so that it could dissipate, so the air could start breathing through the house again, it could dry out. And we knocked on this one man's house, and he said, yes, I need help. I don't have, I don't have any family here. I don't have any friends. I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't have flood insurance. Many of the people here didn't have flood insurance, and so they just see devastation for their immediate future. And this man said, yes, I need help. Thank you so much. Well, I bring a crew over from this church to walk into the house like we did with everybody. And he sees the crew and he is shocked. And he, he stops and says, they can't, they can't come in my house. Well, my, the, the friends that, that I was, that I had, this particular crew was primarily African-American. And this man was, uh, was an older white man. And when I asked him why, he walked me in his house and it, it was a sober moment. His house was a shrine of racism. It was a shrine of white supremacy. He had, he had literal images all over, the, all over his house that were commemorating the supremacy of his race. And here's he, here he is, broken, in need of complete help. And he sees a crew of coming in of African Americans that he realizes, and it wasn't what I immediately thought. I immediately thought, okay, this guy doesn't want them in his house. No, he was embarrassed. In that moment, he was undone, he was broken, and he was embarrassed, and he, he, he was like, I don't, I don't deserve for them to be in my house. And I was provoked in that moment. I was provoked with a compassionate indignation. I was provoked as I looked around and I see 
this sinful representation all around that was an affront to God, the God who says in, in verse 26 that he made one man from every nation of mankind to live on the face of the earth. I was provoked. Now, this crew handled it so well. Handled it so well. They, it was one of the most wonderfully glorious moments that I've ever witnessed, the power of the gospel, as I shared with them what was going on and, and what they were about to walk into. And they said, hey, that's all right. We're going to go in here, and we're going to love him, and we're going to show him the power of the gospel. We're going to love him like Jesus would love him. It was glorious, friends. So I was provoked in that moment. Well, what provoked Paul was the fact that idols all around him were evidence of sin and brokenness in the world. Much like when I walked in this room and saw all of this on a greater level, this man wasn't worshiping that necessarily, but these people were worshiping these idols all around him. They were spiritually blind. They were worshiping things that were no substitute for God at all. And more than that, worship, worship is not just sin and brokenness. It's an affront to God. It's rebellion against the one true God who created us. Paul was a, ma- was a man passionate for the glory of God. If you want to know the secret of personal evangelism, the secret of Paul's personal evangelism, it was his passion for God. Christianity changed everything about this man. It gave him a new identity and a new, and a new purpose. And it does so for everyone who believes. It changes us from the inside out. It gives us new affections, new passions. And primarily, that's passion for the glory of God. Isaiah 42, verse 8, God says, I am the Lord, that is my name. My glory I give to no other, nor my praise to carved idols. Idol worship is sinful because it's a direct affront to the supremacy of the glory of God. It's an act of rebellion against the only true God. And so seeing the idol worship all around, Paul was provoked in his spirit because because of his passion for the glory of God. Are you passionate for the glory of God? Are you provoked when you see people worshiping other gods, other idols, when you see them pouring their life into other things? Does that provoke you, or or have we grown dull to the presence of idols all around us, of false gods in the world? There is no higher motivation, my friends. There is no higher motivation for personal evangelism than a passion for the glory of God. When all else fails, when all the guilt subsides, when our obedience to the Great Commission wanes, a passion for the glory of God, a burning passion to see God's glory displayed all around you in the lives of your neighbors and your family members, everybody you know, that is what will fuel personal evangelism until the end. We should be passionate about the glory of God because God is passionate about the glory of God. Throughout his word, like in Isaiah 42, we see the same thing over and over again is God's passion for his own glory because he knows that is the only thing that will ever satisfy us as people, as his creatures. So Paul was passionate about the glory of God. Simultaneously, he was also compassionate toward the plight of man. He loved people. Once asked, what what is the greatest commandment? Jesus answered, you all remember this, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And he says, and the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. Paul was a man who loved people. Like Jesus, he had compassion on the lost. The Gospel of Luke chapter 19 says that Jesus came to seek and to save the lost. Romans 9.1 says that he has great sorrow and unceasing anguish in his heart over the, over the lostness of those who do not trust in Jesus. Jesus wept over the impenitent city in Jerusalem. Paul was provoked by the idol worship in Athens. These were men who had compassion for the lost, who loved people. When is the last time that you observed the sin and the brokenness all around you? You had compassion on those people and were provoked to proclaim the gospel. We want to be aware that those, there are two categories primarily in life for the Christian, for those with a biblical worldview. There are those who belong to God's kingdom, and there are those who do not. There are those who are saved, and there are those who are lost. And as we look around, as we consider this, we consider the fact that there are two destinations there. There are those who go to heaven, and there are those who go to eternal torment. And as we consider this, this, we want this to fuel our fire. We want this to fan into flame our urgency for proclaiming the gospel 
to those around us. Our hearts should break over the lostness of humanity, and our response should be obedience and faithfulness in evangelism. A passion for God and a love for people drive us to share the greatest news that we have ever received with all those around us. We want, as we sing these songs this morning, you know what I'm praying as we sing these songs, as we're singing songs of gratefulness, as we're praising the God who has redeemed us, as we're singing songs worshiping our God who is now at work in our lives. I want my neighbors to get in on this. I want my family members who don't know the Lord to get in on this. I want those, all of those that I know, to get in because it's for everyone, for all who would believe, indiscriminate. Speaking of this love for others, Mark Dever, a pastor in D.C., wrote a wonderful book on personal evangelism called The Gospel and Personal Evangelism. We have it on the, on the book table up there. I'd strongly uh, commend it to you. It's a wonderful book, very short book, but a very helpful book in thinking about this category. He wrote this in his book. He said, we are called to love others. We share the gospel because we love people, and we don't share the gospel because we don't love people. Instead, we wrongly fear them. We don't want to cause awkwardness. We want their respect. And after all, we figure, if we try to share the gospel with them, we will look foolish. And so we are quiet. We protect our pride at the cost of their souls. In the name of not wanting to look weird, we're we're content to be complicit in their being lost. If we would evangelize more, we must love people more. Friends, this is what God is about. God is at work right now, redeeming humanity from all corners of the globe. He is at work right now, gathering people in, ransoming them by the blood of the cross, giving them a new identity and a new purpose. This is what he has done for you. This is what he has done for me. This is what he has done for all those who are called by, not, by his name. Listen, if you want to be close to Jesus, if you want to feel the nearness of God, if you want to, feel, if you want to dwell intimately with our Savior, if you want to feel the breath of heaven on your face, we want to get near to what God is doing. We want to be where he is, working, doing what he's doing, joining him in his work. And he's at work ransoming people all around the world right now. When we get close to people, when we see their lives and yearn for their salvation, we realize afresh how vital the gospel is. We realize the power of the gospel in that moment. We realize uh, the empowering of the Holy Spirit for the purpose of witness. Instead of often praying for God to come and be where you are, we should look for where he is. Where is he at work? And run and join him. As we look around this city, as we pull into our driveways this afternoon and every day this week, as we get to work and we look around at our coworkers, we chit-chat by the the coffee table, we want to ask God to show us the lostness of those all around of us. We want to ask God to help us see as he sees and to feel as he feels and to give us opportunities to proclaim, give us boldness, That was the prayer of the early church in the book of Acts over and over again, is they asked for boldness to proclaim the gospel. Mark McCloskey wrote a book called Tell It Often, Tell It Well. And he said, if you want to develop a burden for the lost, go out and talk to the lost and find out just how lost they really are. If you desire to have the crucial nature of evangelism branded on your heart, go out and do it. And you will become convinced of just how crucial it is. If you want to develop the conviction that Jesus does indeed change lives, take his life-changing message to others and see if this isn't true. Friends, if we want to grow in our faithfulness, in our effectiveness in personal evangelism, we must fan into flame our passion for God and our love for others, our compassion for the lost. When we have this properly in place, we will find a passion for personal evangelism that is self-sustaining, that will not burn out. Finally, we want to look at what Paul did. So Paul was a man who was passionate about God and compassionate toward the lost. And he was provoked because the idols all around him were evidence of rebellion against the one true God. And the only remedy for that rebellion is the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
It's the power of God for salvation is the gospel, not his persuasive ability. It wasn't his rhetoric, his ability to, to speak words that were right for every occasion. It was the power of God in the gospel that was his hope, and that's what he does. So he begins to preach. He was invited by the Epicureans and the Stoics into the area of Pagus to address the council. They did so because they, it says here that he was preaching foreign divinities in their mind. They called him a babbler, which is obviously not a very flattering term. But babbler even is a, you know insufficient translation to some degree because it doesn't carry the name of, of this kind of unsystematic gathering. And, and ignoramus might be a better word. He was someone who, who was a third-rate intellectual, is what they're saying. They didn't respect him. This is what they prized, is rhetoric and intellect, education, uh, rhetorical ability, persuasion. And Paul comes, and he's not impressive to them. I can identify with that. So he's speaking to these people, the philosophers, the intellectuals, the city, the educated class. And like we saw, like we've seen over and over again throughout the book of Acts, the gospel does not go to a particular kind of person. So we've seen it goes to to Lydia, this wealthy religious woman. We see it goes to this slave girl who is demon-possessed. We see it goes to this Philippian jailer. Last week, we saw the, the it goes to the Jews in Thessalonica and these Um, these religious people in Berea who are very worthy of receiving the word, they studied it. And now it goes to the intellectual, the educated, the philosophers of the day. Wherever he finds them, whatever their social identity or background, Paul gives them the gospel. Because this wasn't a group of people who had a biblical worldview like the Jews uh, in the synagogue would have, before he just launches into speaking to them in religious terms, he backs up and he wants to communicate who God is. He sees that they're religious. He sees that they're worshiping different things, but he wants to make explicitly clear who God in Christ is, what he requires of us, and what he has accomplished for his people. Paul was intent that they understand the importance and the centrality of Jesus Christ in the resurrection. One of the most, extre- one of the most um, compelling things about the speeches that we see in the book of Acts, evangelism in the book of Acts, is how God-centered they are. They begin with God. They don't simply begin with the needs of man. It's not unaware of the needs of men. They are addressed, but they're God-centered and they're apologetic. The focus is on God's actions in history, the fulfillment of God's promises and God's purposes in Scripture. The emphasis is on God's initiative. He is active and personal and imminent. He is very near. In addition, we are accountable to him. David Peterson, a commentator on the book of Acts, said positively, Paul has argued that human beings were created to seek God and have a genuine relationship with him as their creator. Negatively, he has shown that their beliefs and their practices have kept them from a true knowledge of God. And now he makes it clear that they will be held accountable for this. They will be judged for this. Death will come, and after that, judgment. That is certain. And it just so happens in Paul's speech here that God proclaimed an, a man to, to be judge, the man Christ Jesus, to be judge over them, over every person. And the assurance of that judgment, the evidence that Paul gives for that assurance is the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. This is the climax of his speech. More than anything, Paul wanted to point to the reality of the work of Christ and to com- communicate to them it was their obligation in light of this. Now that God has revealed himself to you, now you're required to give a response. Now you'll be held accountable. Now you are called to repent and believe. No one is exempt from this in all of creation. Everyone at all times is called to repent and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And the gift of forgiveness is available to them all, to any who so would believe. And so how do they respond? How do they respond? Well, as we've seen time and again, some mocked. Some mocked, and some said, we will hear you again. They're leaning in. They say, hey, we'll we'll talk, talk again about this. And then some joined him and believed. More often than not, we don't share the gospel because we fear this first one. We fear being mocked. We fear being made fun of. It's uncomfortable. We don't like it. We don't want people to think of us as foolish. We want to be respected. We want to be held in high regard. Not like these intellectuals thought of Paul. I don't want to be thought of as foolish with Paul. I want to be respected. 
And so we stay quiet. We don't, we don't want to make our relationships awkward. And so we stay quiet. But it's a funny thing about fear because fear tends to exaggerate reality, doesn't it? We've all been that child who saw a monster under every bed. But our perception is not often reality. And that monster is often just a pile of dirty clothes. In the same way, we can easily view non-Christians as hostile pagans. We think, if I share the gospel, what if they flog me? Now, that's a reality in parts of the world, but that's not a reality for most of us. If we go home today and we pull in the driveway and we see our neighbor outside and say, hey, Todd, how's it going? Hey, can we, can we talk about something for a few minutes? I've been, I've been wanting to talk to you about this for a while. And I, I'm, I'm sorry that it's taken me this long, but, I, but it's really important to me. I just want to talk to you for a few minutes. And we begin to open up with them. They're not likely to start throwing things at us. They might, they might put up their hands and say, I'm not, I'm not interested in that. Tom Rayner conducted a survey a number of years ago and concluded that 82% of unbelieving men and women in the United States said that they would be somewhat likely to attend church if they were invited. 82%. Only 5%, he found, were openly hostile or antagonistic toward Christianity. People are often more willing to listen to the gospel than we are to tell it. 82%, that's encouraging to me. My fear of being stoned, at least here in the United States, is, is not significant. But some people will mock. Some people will. Some people will make fun of us. Some people will consider us as foolish. Some people will reject the gospel, even when we deliver it effectively, persuasively, when we studied all the evangelism tools that are out there. We had John Payne standing right next to us, and he was even sharing the gospel. They'll even reject it from him. <laughs> even John. Friends, what we're called to in evangelism is faithfulness. We're called to be faithful. That's our job. Evangelism, actually sharing the gospel, is faithful and successful evangelism. The rest is up to God. It's in his hands what he's going to do with somebody's heart. It's in his hand if he's going to open their eyes and grant them faith. Our job is simply to be the delivery person. It's like the FedEx guy. Our job is to deliver the package. Whether the person opens it up or not, that's on them. But we want to faithfully, passionately, urgently, in love, deliver it. (coughs) Paul called the Athenians to repent, aware that there's a day of judgment coming, and aware of the reality of hell and destruction for all those who don't place their hope in Christ. We need to believe that, friends. That is real. That is reality. That is eternal, forever. If we don't consider eternity, if we don't consider the reality of heaven and hell, we'll have little urgency in reaching out with the gospel. If we don't see this as an urgent reality for our friends, for our neighbors, for our family members, they will certainly not see it as an urgent reality. Friends, it's our sacred privilege, our sacred privilege and joy to help lead people, to point them from destruction to life. Much like it's the It's the privilege of someone who sees someone in danger and has the ability to rescue them out of that danger, pushing them out of the way of an oncoming car. It's a sacred privilege and joy to see disaster averted. We get to join God in the advance of the gospel. We get to go where he is. We get to feel heaven near to us. We get to feel the empowering of the Holy Spirit. We get to join God in the advance of his gospel. Some mocked, some leaned in, and some joined him and believed. This is our prayer. This is our goal. This is what we're after. This is what we're praying for, is we want, we want this church, Redemption Hill Church, to have an impact in this community, in the city of Round Rock, and Leander, and Cedar Park, Austin, all around. We want to have an impact with the gospel. We want to see our neighbors coming to faith. We want to have baptisms on a regular basis of people coming to faith in Jesus Christ, going from death to life. That's what we're after. We want to see people put their trust in Jesus, the crucified and risen Savior, for the forgiveness of their sins and for eternal life, as Paul, as Juan reminded us as we sang. And they joined him. They joined Paul. They became disciples who continued to listen to his teachings, and they formed a community of believers, a church. John Stott, another commentator on this book, wondering why the church continues to struggle in evangelism, said this. 
He said, we do not speak as Paul spoke because we do not feel as Paul felt. We have never had the indignation which he experienced. Divine jealousy has never stirred within us. If we do not see like Paul, or if we do not speak like Paul, because we do not feel like Paul, this is because we do not see like Paul. That was the order. He saw, he felt, he spoke. When Paul walked around Athens, he did not just notice the idols. He looked and looked and thought and thought until the fires of holy indignation were kindled within him. For he saw men and women created by God in the image of God, giving to idols the homage which was due to him alone. Almighty God is passionate about his glory. And one day, this is certain, every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord. That is not in question. God is the sovereign actor in all of salvation. What is in question is whether we will join him or not. The entire book of Acts shows the advance of the gospel of Jesus Christ through the disciples, through the ordinary Christians, men and women like you and me, taking the great commission and putting it into practice. And we get to continue that work. It's a glorious calling. It's a privilege and an honor to do it. It is a great commission. It is great. God declares in Psalm 46.10, Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. God will see it through. This is his work. It's what he's about. This is where he is. And we can get in on it. It's spectacular. And we're invited to participate. So let's fuel the flame in our hearts for the passion, for the glory of God, and love for others, compassion for the lost. And let that provoke us to compassionate indignation. Let that provoke us to passionate personal evangelism. Please join me in prayer. Well, Father in heaven, we come to you this morning and singing songs of gratefulness. Holy is your name. Thank you, God, for the salvation that we enjoy by faith in Jesus Christ that we receive by grace from you. Father, I pray that you would help us today to reflect on our own story of salvation, that we'd reflect on that moment when somebody shared the good news of Jesus Christ with us. Maybe it started with them inviting us to church or, or you know, offering us a book. Maybe it started small. But Father, thank you for that moment. Thank you for saving us. Thank you for working in us now. Thank you for the empowering and the indwelling power of your Holy Spirit. Father, I pray for us this morning that you would give us a passion for your glory. Help us to see you and to love you as Jesus commended. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Father, help us to have a passion for your glory and help us to love our neighbors, ourselves. Help us, Lord, particularly to have compassion for the lost. Help us to see our neighbors. Help us to see our family members. Help us to see friends and coworkers. Help us to see sin and brokenness all around us and to be provoked. Father, I pray that you would give us a taste of the privilege of joining you in your work where you are and that you would add people to your household. We pray this, Father, for the glory of your name, for the joy of all peoples everywhere. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, as always, we um, would love to pray for you if there's anything at all that we can pray for you about, whether that's about applying God's word from this message, whether that's you're praying for an illness or a relational conflict that you're walking through right now. Anything at all, we would love to pray for you. John and I will be available down at the front. Our community group leaders, their wives will be available down at the front. Um, in just a few moments, the room's going to get a little bit busy. We have lunch. We're very excited to, to gather together as we do several times throughout the year. So feel free to please grab your children from Children's Ministry. Thank, your, thank those who are volunteering back there in Children's Ministry. And thank you for all of you who do that on a regular basis. Um, please thank them. Wesley Prater is 
raising his hand in the back. He's going to lead the charge in clearing this room of chairs and bringing out tables. So please see him. He'll give direction for setting up the room. Lori Sue Prater and her team are going to gather everybody in a few moments. Uh, they're going to be setting up lunch. And we'll come back in probably 10 minutes or so and, uh, and enjoy some uh, extended fellowship uh, as we gather over food. Let me leave you with this. Numbers 6, 24 through 26. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Let's enjoy a time of fellowship now. Love you. Grateful for you.